All right. So now that we've finished chapter six, again, this is going to be um, your example for the lower cost of market. Again, you have a, a copy of the exam. You have the exercises to be able to practice this and also the previous study guide for this exact particular section if you need help on it. Okay. So now we're going to be moving into new territory, things that we haven't um, been studying for, or in this case, um, if you go through chapters 7 through 11, there's a bunch of examples that we've done in class, but this is the first time we're going to go over through the study guide, okay? So again, chapter 7 and chapter 8 was dealing with perpetual inventory, okay? So number 7, number 27 here, your tracking method is perpetual on June 1st, okay? You made a purchase on uh of 10 coffee mugs for two dollars and 35 cents each and um and a freight cost you a hundred dollars if you purchase this um on an account record this uh transaction so here we're practicing journalizing perpetual inventory so in this case it's june 1st we bought a hundred toys excuse me a hundred coffee mugs all right at $2.35 each with a freight costing $100. So how am I going to journalize this? Uh, with uh, infant uh, mugs and um, cash. Oh, wait. Is it cash? Oh, uh, accounts payable. Good, right. Accounts payable. Now, in this case, right, how much is going to be my grand total that I'm going to be writing in here. How much am I going to journalize? Uh, 335. 335. So in this case, we're going to put everything into inventory, including freight. Okay. 28. Okay. On June 7th, you received your coffee mugs and found Two of the um, two of them were cracked. Okay, and of course you requested um, a, a refund for your from your vendor. Okay, so record this transaction. Well, I cannot read today. All right, so there you go. So if on June seventh you end up returning or found that you had a bunch of uh, cracked mugs in your shipment okay how do you record the refund to your vendor account payable and mugs good right in this case i never made a payment to this um, purchase so therefore i'm going to decrease the amount that i owe and it's going to be taken out directly from my inventory because that's where i placed it so in this case how much am I, is it going to cost me per mug 235. 235. So 235 times two? $4.70. Uh, $4.70. Okay. Good. All right. Number 29. Okay. Uh, this time on June 8th, you sold 25 mu coffee mugs for $10 each. So if it cost you $3.37 each... Okay, um, assume there's no sales tax. All sales were made with cash. So in this case, how are we going to journalize this? Um, cash, sales, and ta uh, sales tax payable. In this case, there's no sales tax. It says right here, assume oh, there's no oh, sales tax. Well, uh, uh, sorry. No worries. Okay. So in this case, if I sold each mug, 25 mugs, for $10 each, what's my total amount that I should be receiving? $250. Okay. Since this is perpetual inventory, what extra part journal do I need to record? 
Good, right? Inventory, or in this case, we know exactly what the inventory item is, which is mugs. So if it costs me $3.37 each, how much is it going to cost me to sell 25 of those cups? $84.25. Okay. Good. All right. So then, question 30 here. On June 10, a customer returns two coffee mugs for a full refund. Okay. And, of course, um, each, uh, each coffee mug you sold was for $10 each. And it cost you three dollars and thirty-seven cents um, each. So record this transaction. You're gonna use sales returns and allowance and cash. Okay. For how much? Uh, six dollars and seventy-four cents. Okay, where did you get six dollars? Twenty. Twenty dollars, right? Because I originally sold to my customer ten dollars per cup, and the customer is returning to me two of them. Looking at, uh, I put the uh, $3.37. Okay, so in this case? Just $20. $20, yes. Okay, now in this case, the customer is giving me a, is uh, returning the product, right? Because they wanted a full refund. So what's my assumption I have to do? I uh, use um, uh, mugs and Costco goods sold. Yes, right. We have to put the the coffee mugs back into my inventory. So cost of goods sold. Okay. And how much did it cost me per cup? Uh, six seventy four. Okay. So then that's gonna give me oh six seventy four. Okay. Good. All right, so you do need to know this because I will be testing you on this and I'm going to be asking you. Um, you're going to debit this. You're going to credit that, okay? So your multiple choice answers, make sure you exhaust through all the answers because it could be A and B or A and C, okay? It could be D, all of the above, okay? So here we are now, we're moving into chapter eight, which I'm gonna be testing you, right? On all, uh, on all two, okay, I'm gonna do two methods just because FIFO is, LIFO and FIFO are pretty much similar. So in this case, right, let's go ahead and practice this, right? We have your perpetual LIFO, okay? So, if on June 1st, I purchased 100 toys at a dollar each with a freight costing you 25. So the date is June 1st. We're going to skip over this cost of goods sold section. We got 100 toys at a dollar each with a freight costing you 25. So, of course, that means your purchase price here is 100. Plus 25 gives you a total cost of 125, which then... Each item is going to cost me a dollar and 25 cents each. Okay. Then on June 10, you purchase 200 toys costing at a dollar 25 cents each with a freight of 50. Okay, so June 10, we purchase 200 units at a dollar 25 which gives you 250 plus 50 gives makes it 300. So this makes my av my cost per item to be 
a dollar and fifty cents. Okay. So then let's see what happened next. In this case, right on June twelfth, you sold two hundred toys at five dollars each. No sales tax. So in this case, let's see. Take a look. We are using perpetual lifo. Okay. So in this case, what am I gonna do with my June twelfth batch of it? A batch here that I sold. Uh, you take away from the um, June tenth um, batch. Mm hmm. So in this case, if I sold two hundred units, how much did it cost me? If I'm looking at lifo, which batch of inventory you said the June ten. So it's going to cost me a dollar fifty each. So in this case, I'm going to get rid of three hundred. So again, okay. So therefore, this entire batch of inventory is gone. Okay. I think it's this one strike there. Nope. I think it's this one. There you go. No. Nope. Okay. Strike three is not on here. It's this one. There you go. Okay. All right. So that means I don't even have this batch of inventory anymore. So then, next thing is June fifteen. We end up purchasing three hundred toys at a dollar fifty, with the freight costing seventy five. So it's June 15. We purchased 300 units at a dollar 50 with the freight costing 20 uh, 75. So in this case, this was what 450 plus 75 gave you 525 which made each item a dollar and 75 cents. Okay. So then June 20th, you sold 250 toys at $5 each. Okay, so June 20th. Okay, so what do I do here? Um, you take away 250 from the batch of June, uh, June 15th, with the 300. Good, so in this case, how much does it cost me per item here? A dollar seventy five. So two fifty times a dollar seventy five. Four hundred thirty seven fifty. Four thirty seven fifty. Okay, minus two fifty. Minus four three seven fifty. So then I should have remaining from this batch 50 units at a total of eighty seven fifty. Eighty seven fifty. Thank you. Okay. So then June thirtieth. Okay, you have a total of 150 toys left on hand. So let's go ahead and double confirm that. So at the very end of my table, right, I have um, 50 plus 100. So yes, I do have 150. Okay, so 8750 plus 125, what does that equal? Two twelve fifty. Okay. Uh, what about this? Um, on the cost of goods sold, um, four hundred. I'm sorry. Two hundred plus two fifty gives you four fifty. Okay, giving me a grand total of three hundred plus four four thirty seven fifty gives you seven three seven fifty. Okay. So now let's go ahead and answer the questions. What is the total cost of your ending inventory? In this case, two twelve fifty. 
And what's the total value of your cost of goods sold? Seven three seven fifty. Okay. So let's go over this one more time, except this time it's going to be perpetual moving average, okay? So in this case, right, let's take a look at, we're gonna round to the nearest penny, okay, towards the very end of this um, segment here. So in this case, right, June 1st, we purchase a total of 100 units at a dollar each. So 100 times a dollar gives you 100 plus 25 makes it 125 makes it a dollar 25 okay but this time on June 10 we actually purchased an additional 200 units at a dollar and 25 cents each which gave you 250 plus 50 of freight made it $300 okay so in this case, right, I now need to add up my totals because now I'm taking an average. So in this case, I need to figure out what my total total quantity is, right? 100 plus 200 gives you 300, all right, with a total total cost of 425, right? 125 plus 300, 425. So now I need to figure out what my average cost per item is going to be. So what is 425 divided by 300? What's my uh, average cost here? 141667. Okay. $1 okay. So then, June 12th rolls around, and I end up selling 200 units. So, June 12th, I end up selling 200 units at $1.41667. So in this case, what's my total cost of goods sold here? Uh, 283.33. Okay, so that's what I'm going to subtract out, right? I'm going to subtract my 200 units, okay, at um, 283.33, okay, and that should give me a remaining of 100 here with a remaining of one four one six 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 seven yeah six seven okay which then gives me my average cost of one point four one six seven same thing right this time it ends on a seven then on June fifteen we end up purchasing three hundred more units at a dollar fifty with a freight costing seventy five. So June fifteen we purchased three hundred units at a dollar fifty, which brought me to four fifty plus seventy five, which brings me to five twenty five. Okay. So then in this case, right, now I need to recalculate my quantity and my total cost. So in this case, right, 300 plus 100 gives me a total of 400 units. Okay. At a total cost of my, um, total cost of my inventory is going to be six, 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 seven. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So then now I need to solve for my new average cost, because in this case, I have to recalculate my average cost per item. So 66667 divided by my quantity of 400, what should I get here? What's my new average cost per item? 166675. Right, 166675. Okay. So then, 
June 20th rolls around and you end up selling another 250 units. So, it's June 20th. June 20th, we end up selling 250 units at $1.66675. That's how many sixes? Is it four sixes? Yes. Okay, four sixes. Oops. Okay. So then in this case, what is my total amount here of my cost of goods sold? Four sixteen sixty seven. Four sixteen sixty seven. So then if I subtract two fifty out from here and I subtract four one six six seven, then my new ending balance here is gonna be one fifty at a total here. Two hundred and fifty. Two hundred and fifty. Okay, and of course, right? We need to add up our t totals here as well. So T for total. So in this case, I sold four hundred and fifty units at a grand total amount of seven hundred. Yes? Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. So then let's answer the question here. Your ending inventory balance is going to be 250, right? And of course, your um, cost of goods sold end up being 700. So again, uh, and this. I think I got lost somewhere. Okay. How did we get the the total for the cost of goods sold? Four hundred. Four fifty at the end. <coughs> Correct. Four fifty at the end, right? Whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. Two eighty three thirty three plus four sixteen sixty seven. Right. Should give you seven hundred, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. All right. Any other questions here? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's go to chapter nine. Okay. Use the following information to answer the next question. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. On January 1st, you establish a petty cash fund for $500. Okay. By January 31st, you uh, counted all of your receipts. So here, you bought a birthday cake. <coughs> Excuse me. For $19.99. You bought pizza for $23.78. You bought some office supplies for $6.02, and you bought postage stamps for $10.75 each, okay? So question number 35 says, okay, um, what amount do you need to write a check for to replenish your petty cash fund? B. B. 60.54. 60.54. How did you figure this number out? Good. They're good. <laughs> good. That's correct, right? That's the rule here. To replenish the petty cash fund, you obviously have money in the uh, in the cash drawer, but you need to replace those receipts with actual cash. So in this case, you calculate the total number of receipts and you write the check out for the total amount. So in this case, 6054 should be correct. Yes. Good. Okay. How do you establish a petty cash fund? Oops, sorry. Yeah, 
How do you replan how do you establish a petty cash fund? Hey. A, you're gonna debit your petty cash fund and credit your checking. That is correct. A. That's to establish. Yes. Okay. Number 37. How do you replenish a petty cash fund? That's correct, right? You're going to write a check, right? We just did the example. You're going to write a check in the total amount of receipts in the lockbox, in the petty cash fund. Yes. Okay. Chapter 10, okay? Under um, which method does the IRS use to write off bad debt expense for... Um, Tax purposes only. Bad, bad debt expense. No. Okay, so it's not B. Um, what was the other answer? Uh, C. C, direct write-off method, yes. There's no such thing as a bad debt expense method, okay? Uh, we all, I only taught you two, which is the allowance method and the bad, the right, the direct write-off method. In this case, the direct write-off method is the one that we cannot use because we are not tax accountants. It's strictly only used for IRS um, uh, only, Okay, and it's for tax purposes, right? To completely write it off of your books so you don't have to pay the tax for it, right? You end up taking a loss in this case. Okay. All right, number tw number 39, okay? A company estimates that 34887 of your 500,000 accounts receivable is to be uncollectible. There is currently a debit balance of $5,000 in the allowance for doubtful accounts. The adjustment entry will be? B. B, um, 39887. So in this case, um, let's go ahead and journalize it. So you're going to have... Your bad debt expense. Okay. And you're also going to have allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay. So in this case, right, we're looking at the estimated amount of the 34887, right? In this case, it's accounts receivable. So that tells me what? That means I care about what the value is in my allowance for doubtful accounts. In this case, I have a debit balance. So in order to make it a credit balance of 34887, I need to add this amount in here because I'm already on the left side. I need to be on the right side. So in this case, I'm going to add 5,000 to the 34 to give me 39887. Okay? 39887. And B is correct. So what would be an example where you would say credit as opposed to add? It would say it would say credit. And we're gonna take a look down below. So in this case, right? If I had a credit balance, then I would subtract it, right? So again, here uh, for question 40, a company estimates that 34887 of its 500,000 total credit sales is to be uncollectible. And there's currently a credit balance of $5,000 in the allowance for doubtful accounts. The adjustment entry will be... A, 34887 is correct. 
in this case, right? What is my keyword that I'm looking for? In this case, 34887 was a total of my total credit sales. So that means I don't see the allowance or doubtful accounts or the accounts receivable appear on my income statement. So therefore, that tells me I only have one number to focus on, and that's going to be whatever my estimated amount was, which is the 34887. Okay. So therefore, the correct answer here is A. Okay. So here, uh, Maribel is it going to be an example of a credit balance here. Okay. If a company estimates that thirty-four eight eight seven thousand seven hundred, right? Um, it's five hundred thousand accounts receivable is to be uncollectible, and there is currently a credit balance of $5,000 in the allowance for double accounts. The adjustment entry will be, so in this case, right, I'm already on the right side. I need to get to 34887 but I'm already on the right side. How much more do I need to get to 34887 The 29 the 20, yeah, 29, right? You take the 34 and you're subtracting the five because you already have a credit balance. You need to get, the end goal is to be at 34,000 credit. So in this case, 34 minus five gives you 29,887. So there you go, 29,887. Okay, then go back up real quick. So okay. The, the one that we debited, we were supposed to add. I'm confused why it's not 39, why it's still 34887. Does it not matter? I'm confused. It's because, okay, so the it's different. 39. Okay, okay, so the first one, or the second one, I guess, this one, it depends on which uh, financial statement you're looking at. Okay? Mm -hmm. In this I case, I'm, I'm behind. Never mind, I'm behind. So I was right. I just, I'm. So number 39 is B, 39,000. Number 40 is A, 34,000. And then 41 is the 29. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I have confused. Okay. So, yeah, the only difference here is you need to be careful of which uh, financial financial statement you're looking at, right? We have two of them, right? The balance sheet and the income statement. In this case, the income statement does not have the um, account receivable or the allowance adoptable account. So that's why this one is just going to be whatever number that is appearing right here, regardless, because it doesn't matter what the balance is here. But when it comes to account receivable, that means I. That means it's going to be on the balance sheet. If there's an account receivable, an allowance for double accounts, it's a contra account to account receivable. So it's definitely going to be there. So in this case, I need to know how much is in the is my um, current balance in my allowance for double accounts because it's because I need to be at the end of the day. I need to be at a credit balance in my allowance for double accounts. Okay, and that is, I need to be at 34,000. Okay. All right. So then. Okay. Repeat, repeat the part about the journal and the income, the one that doesn't mind about the accounts receivable part. Okay, so in this case, the accounts receivable appears on the balance sheet. Okay, because the balance sheet consists of everything that's an asset liability and an equity. It tests the accounting equation, right? So in this case, the balance sheet is going to have all of your assets, which account receivable is an asset, right? It's And it's going to also contain the contra account, too, of the allowance for doubtful accounts. So when I know that this appears on the balance sheet, right, the keyword we're looking for is account receivable, okay? Because that's going to be telling me that this is on the balance sheet. 
And then if I care about what's on the balance sheet, that means I care about what the balance is going to be in the allowance or doubtful accounts because it appears. It affects my accounts receivable, right? So that's why on the number 40 where it says total credit sells, that's what's highlighted? Correct. It doesn't say accounts receivable anywhere, so that's why it's just the 3487. Correct, because uh, this one, the total credit sales... It shows up on the income statement. When you do your income statement, you're going to learn that it lists all of your revenues, all of your expenses, and and, 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 and in this case, is an asset going to be considered a revenue? No. No, because a revenue is a revenue, right? So in this case, what you will definitely see is your total credit sales. And of course, in, in blatant terms, right, when we understand what credit sales means, it means those were sales that we had on an account. It means people owed us money. But that's indirectly because on the income statement, nowhere do we see accounts receivable. And of course, if there's no accounts receivable, we're definitely not going to see the allowance for doubtful account. So in this case, we don't care if there's a balance in there. All we care about is at the end of the day, I'm going to be writing off $34,887 because it's a total credit sale. So then let's go ahead and do the... Teacher. Yes. Uh, also, I need to understand the rule, the rule for myself. Okay. If I have, if in any question, I found account receivable, uh -huh. the, the estimate change has to change yes but in total credit no change also the estimate no change yes change. correct thank you very much teacher. Mm -hmm. so yeah so in this case right let's take a look at number 30 number 42 excuse me all right so number 42 if a company estimates that three three thirty four thousand eight hundred and eighty seven out of its five hundred thousand total credit sales is to be uncollectible and there's currently a debit balance of five thousand dollars in the allowance or doubtful accounts the adjustment entry will be is it just thirty four eight eight seven thirty four correct because this is the income statement they, we don't care about what's in the allowance or doubtful accounts. We only care about what the estimated number was. And that's 34,887. Also in the question number 40, the same estimate amount. Right. Except the only difference here is there's a debit balance or a credit balance in my allowance for doubtful accounts. Thank you, teacher. Yes. Yeah, so in this case... There's no change, if you want to look at it that way too, there's no change when it comes to total credit sales, but when it is accounts receivable, you do change it. Okay. All right. All right, so we're almost done here. It's up to you. Do you want to take a break now or you want to just push through? I was going to ask take like a just a short one i am babysitting i have to feed this kid okay no okay let me just all right so uh we'll just take a short one um okay okay so again um we're going to continue on so we have this section here for chapter 10 where we're going to be doing a bank reconciliation so it says right here use the following tables below to answer the next question so here we have a bank statement okay it looks just like this now of course um on orban it's not going to look the same like this it's going to look just like two tables and then it's going to give you all the information you need to be able to answer the question so in this case right we have our bank statement okay here's our check register as well as our um checking um ledger check ledger and check register as well as your deposit slips, okay? And of course, I'm gonna be providing you the table, all right? 
So let's go ahead. Which side do you want to do the first? You want to do the bank or you want to do the cash side? Bank. Let's do the bank. Okay, so let's start off with the ending balance in our bank account. So you need to take a look at your bank statement. What is the ending balance? 851. 800, that, that's your beginning balance. Ending, oh, 1088. Yeah, 1088. Okay, so 1088. All right. Now, what do we need to add on the bank side? Deposits. Deposits. So let's take a look. In this case, let's look at our receipts and deposits. We have a total of one, two, three, four, and five deposits. Now let's check our bank statement. How many deposits have cleared? Four. Only four. So let's take a look. So we got 360, 297, 284 and 126. So let's take a look here at our. So here's the 360, 297, 284, 126. So I'm missing. I'm missing the 483. So in this case, I'm going to put deposit on August 30th for 438. Okay. So then what is next? It's 483. 483, thank you. 483. Okay. So then what do I need to subtract out? Our checks. Our checks. So let's take a look at our check register. How many checks did we write out? We wrote eight, right? From 101, 301, eight, 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 eight. all the way to 308. Okay, so let's go ahead and confirm which checks have cleared. Six and seven. Six and seven have not cleared, been cleared yet. So let's take a look at what my check 306 and 307 is. Check number 306 and 307 is for 314 and 40, 30, I cannot read, 54. Okay, so 314 and $54. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say check, check number 307, oh, 306 for 314. And then we have check, check number uh, 307 for $54. Okay, so then what is the total amount that I need to subtract? 364, 68. 368, okay. So in this case, let's go ahead and calculate our grand totals here. So if I started out with 1088, I'm going to add 483, and I'm going to subtract 368. 1203 is the total. 1203. Okay. So now we got to double check on our cash side if that matches. Okay. So in this case, what's my ending balance in my cash ledger side? So here's my ledger. Eleven fifty three. Eleven fifty three. Oops. Eleven fifty three. My bad. Eleven fifty three. Okay. What do I need to add on the cash side? Interest and eight. Mhm. A C H. Mhm. Mm Auto clearing house is what it stands for. Auto clearing house. So let's go ahead and take a look at my ACH and my Where interest. Where did you get 1150 from? I'm sorry? The 1153? Where did you get 1153 from? I'm trying to... Okay, so this is yeah. my check 
cash ledger, right? So this is mm -hmm. this is my ledger account. So it's gonna always tell me what my ending balance is in my or my balance is in uh okay. the account. So then I just looked at the very end of August thirty first, and I have a debit balance of eleven fifty three. Okay. So in this case, we're looking at auto clearinghouse and interest. So auto clearinghouse, I have a hundred and twenty-five dollars, and my interest was seventy-five. Okay, so I'm gonna plug that in here. Interest was seventy-five. Auto clearinghouse was one twenty-five, making that what two hundred dollars. Okay. Yes. So then, what do I need to subtract? Your service fees, fees. you're not sufficient fees. on your tax. Correct. Fees. Correct. So let's take a look at my bank uh, statement. In this case, I only got charged a service charge and one NSF because if you look here, um, I didn't have enough money, so it just it, they wrote it in for me. Okay. Uh, but it didn't return or it didn't bounce, so that means they pushed it forward. So in this case, let's take a look. Okay. My service fee was $100, and my NSF they charged me was $50. Okay, so service charge was $100, and NSF was $50. So in this case, I need to subtract $150. So in this case, let's take a look. If I had 11.53 plus 200, go ahead. It's 12.03. It's 12.03, perfect. So in this case, let's take a look at my answers. So what is the adjusted balance in the bank and cash ledger account? 12.03 is the answer, okay? So like I said, I'm only going to test you on the basics. If you know deposits and outstanding checks as well as interest and fees. That's all I need you to know. Nothing else. Okay. Number 24, okay. Um, you bought a bank bond, okay, worth uh, three, oh, sorry, worth $200,000, okay. And its simple interest rate is 7.75%, okay. And of course, um, it can be redeemable at the end of, at the end, at any time, okay? How much will the bank bond be worth in 10 years? So what's my interest going to be? Fifteen thousand five hundred. How did you figure that number out? Um, multiplying the principal with um, rate. Principal times rate of point zero seven seven five. Okay. What else do I have to multiply it by? Oh, um, years. By years. So in this case, what is my um interest going to be? Yes. So then what does, okay, so then what is my um, future value it is going to be? Because it's asking me right now, what is, how much is it going to be worth at the end of 10 years? So is it asking for interest or is it asking for future value? Future value. It's asking for future value. So what's my future value going to be? 355000 Good. So you have to be careful when reading because one will be um, how much interest, interest will be collected at the end of X amount of years. And the other question will be how much will it be worth at the end of X amount of years. So you want to be careful on what the question is asking. Is it asking for interest or is it asking for future value? In this case, it's asking you what the bond will be worth in 10 years, which is future value. So in this case, the answer is 355 Okay. 
Um, in this case right here is a um, compound interest. I'm going to skip over this just because, um, again, I'm not going to test you on it. So there's no purpose for you to practice this unless you want to practice it. Um, so I'm going to skip on over to this. The answer sheet will have the answer of this on there. So don't worry about that either. Okay. Last chapter we have is chapter 11. Okay. So here you go. What, uh, when, excuse me, what fixed assets can never be depreciated? Land. Okay. I will test you on this too. Okay. Number 17. Okay. If fixed assets are depreciated, then intangible assets are okay. amortized. Good. Right. Number 48. If a machine was put into surface as of January 19, when do you start depreciating it? February C. C, February 1st, right? Because we're assuming if you place into service as of the 19, that falls after the 15. So therefore, that means you only use it less than 50% of the month. So therefore, it's just better to just do it as if it was the 1st of February. Correct. Okay. 1st of February. Where is there? Here. Okay. 1st of February. Good. Question number 49. Gap determines what two components for depreciation. So this one I'm being specific. If there's only two. B and, I mean, D, B and C only. Good. Correct. Right. B and C only. It determines salvage value and it determines uh, the estimated useful life. Right. The estimated useful life comes in like a nice fancy book that you can look up your asset um, uh, your asset co uh, life. So you can also determine it on the bot, the manufacturing box as well. It will also tell you the lifespan on there as well. Um, of course, in the salvage value under IRS or under uh, gap, it just depends because they determine whether there's a va holding value or not. Okay. So in this case, IRS um, slash gap, there's no holding value. Number 50, what are the three depreciation methods? All of the above. All of the above, correct. Right, you need to know all three. Units of production, double declining, and straight line. Okay. So then question number 51 asks, under the, under the double declining method, at the end, book value must equal... Estimated useful life. Okay, so in this case, right? C. Estimated useful life. In this case, double declining, will it ever reach its end of its life? No. It's possible that it can have a shorter life, right? Because you're you're depreciating it twice as much. You're you know, you're you're using it so much to the point where it might not even last long. Okay? So in this case, it's not depending on its estimated useful life. It must equal salvage value, right? Book value cannot fall below salvage value, right? And if it does, then you have to work backwards to make it so then it equals the salvage value. Okay. Do any of the methods equal estimated useful life? Not for book value. Book value will always equal salvage value. Okay. Mm -hmm. Use the table below to answer the next two questions. So here you go. Here's your first example here where we're looking at a computer and it costs you a total of uh, 2,500. The method that we're using is straight line. Salvage value is zero. Estimated useful life is five years. Date that you're placed in the surface, January 5th, okay? So again, year one, what's the depreciation basis going to be? This is straight line.
depreciation basis for a straight line. Uh, would it be, um, no, uh, asset cost might, uh, so it would just be 2500 Good, right? Asset cost minus salvage value in this case is 2500 Good. What's my depreciation rate going to be? Five years. Five years. But what do you do with that five years? Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. One divided by five, which gives you 20%. Good. So then depreciation expense is going to be? 500. 500. Okay. Which makes your accumulated depreciation 500. So then book value is going to be? 2000 $2,000. So then, what's my depreciation basis going to be for year two? Same. It's, it's the same. Good. And so was the rate, right? Yes. Yes. And the depreciation. Expense. Good. And the depreciation expense. So that means we got a thousand accumulated and this is going to be fifteen hundred. So here's what the question's gonna ask you, right? I can ask you any any question. Is it gonna be depreciation expense? Is it going to be based on book value? So in this case, what is the depreciation expense for year one in year two? Five hundred. It's gonna be five hundred. Good. And then now second question is, what is going to be the book, val the book value as for year two? B, 1500. B, 1500. So yes, good. Okay. All right, use the table down below to answer the next two questions. This time we have a printer, okay? And we're gonna be using units of production. It has a asset cost of $500. The number of units that it can produce is going to be um, 10,000 pages and no salvage value. And the date that you place into service is January 2nd. Okay. So in this case, what's my depreciation basis going to be for units of production? Uh, 500 since there's no value. Good. Excellent, right? It's the same thing as what we did earlier. It's going to be your asset cost minus salvage value. In this case, we have 500 minus zero will give you 500. Okay. What is going to be my per unit rate? Per unit rate. It's the unit of production... Is it divided by the depreciation basis? Okay, so backwards. Oh, yeah, depreciation base. Base is divided by the units of production? Yes, units that it can produce. So in this case, what which number are yeah. you going to choose? 10,000. 10,000, right? You want to know the capacity, right? Because what we're doing here is we want to know how much is it going to cost me per unit if I were to uh, cost it that way, right? I'm looking for what the cost is going to cost me for every unit that I make, how much it's going to cost me. So in this case, we're looking at the capacity of how much it can produce in general. So again, 500 divided by 10,000. It should be 0. 0.5, right? 0. 0.05, 5 cents yeah. per page. So in this case, if I were to depreciate it, right, if I produced 2,500 pages for the first year, how much is my depreciation expense going to be? 125. 125. 125. Therefore, what's my book value going to be as of year one? Three seventy five. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the same thing for year two. Okay, what's my depreciation basis going to be? Five hundred. It's going to be the same, right? It's going to be the same five hundred. What about my per unit rate? Zero five. It's also going to be the same, right? Point zero five. 
However, the difference is going to be my depreciation expense. This time, I only produced two thousand pages. So, how much is it is my depreciation expense going to be for year two? One hundred. A hundred. Oops. A hundred. So, in this case, a hundred plus one twenty-five should give you two twenty-five. So then, what is your go what is your total book value going to be? Two seventy five. Two seventy five. So let's answer the questions here. Okay. Number fifty four. What is the depreciation expense for year one? One twenty five. Okay. What is the book value for year two? Two seventy five. Two seventy five. Okay. Last but not least, we have our last one, which is double declining, okay? This time, it's the same thing. We're going to have the computer brought back again for 2500 salvage value zero, estimated use of life five years, with the date that you placed into service was January 5th, okay? So in this case, what is my depreciation basis for double declining? Twenty five hundred, right? In this case, it's because it's going to be my beginning of the year book value. Okay, what's my depreciation rate going to be? Forty percent. Right, it's going to be one divided by five times two, which equals forty percent. Okay, so then what's going to be my depreciation expense for year one? It's going to be 1,000. So then that's 1,000. So that will leave you 1,500. Okay. So then what is going to be my depreciation basis for year two? 1,500. It's going to be the beginning of the year's book value, okay, which is going to be 1,500. All right. My, book, my depreciation rate is going to be 40% once again. So then what is going to be my depreciation expense for year two? $600. $600. So that becomes $1,600. Whoops, $1,600, which becomes $900. Okay. So then, right, answer the question here. 56 says, what is the depreciation expense for year one? $1,000. Okay, what is um, the book value for year two? 900 dollars. Okay, so again, I will be testing you on all three methods of depreciation, so make sure you know the ins and outs of what to do. Now, of course, I'm only going to be testing you on the first couple of years, so I'm not going to test you what happens at the end, okay? Um, but I just need to make sure that you know how to depreciate it within the first two years, right? Two years should give you enough, in, could give me enough information that you know what you're doing. Okay, so that is that. All right, any questions in regards to the study guide or anything that we are going to be testing on? Once again, everything is going to be open book, open note, open lecture videos, whatever you want to